familiar name for many in South Florida. He's a former state representative and he served as director of the Florida Division of Emergency Management during the COVID-19 pandemic under Governor Ron DeSantis. Now the Broward Commissioner wants to represent you in Washington. Here's my conversation with Jared Moskowitz. Commissioner Moskowitz, thank you so much for joining us here on NBC6 Impact. Thank you. Good morning. So we have a lot to unpack from the shootings this past weekend to the abortion law and the list goes on. But I do want to start with your announcement to run for Congress, District 23. It's reconfigured, but it's pretty much similar to the one that Representative Ted Deutsch covered for so many years. Why did you just decide to run for this seat and why now? Well, the reason I decided to run is the same answer is why now? I mean, the stakes uh, in this country right now politically could not be higher. Uh, with the division in this country, with Roe v. Wade just being overturned, with LGBTQ rights, uh, you know, being on the line, uh, we have, you know, record inflation, high gas prices. I mean, middle class America is struggling, and we have to do more to help them. We got a situation in Ukraine going on. How we're going to get out of that? And so, between geopolitical politics uh, and stuff going at home, I mean, Donald Trump's talking about running again. I mean, if, as a Democrat who cares about this country who wants to get things done, I mean, you know, we're, we're, we're faced with, you know, a very tough task uh, on trying to fight for our democratic values at this moment. As a Democrat in the state of Florida, and you were the only elected appointed Democrat in the DeSantis administration, how was that working under those conditions? Well, look, I had a nonpartisan job, so I didn't get engaged in the partisan politics, obviously. What is it that you did exactly? Sure. I was the director of emergency management, so I was in charge of the state's response to hurricanes, and I was in charge of the first 18 months of responding to COVID. And so, look, I took that job because I had a mass shooting in my backyard at Marjorie Stillman Douglas High School, which is my neighborhood, my high school, and, you know, I watched 17 families bury their kids. I mean, no graduation, no weddings, no grandkids, no no. Future. Uh, and so when the idea came to me about a Democrat running a state agency that helps people in their time of need, the Democrats around the state and the Democratic Party wanted me to do it and supported me doing it, and that's why I took the job. Were you able to work across party lines in that position? Yeah, it's a nonpartisan job. So, right. I mean, uh, helping Democrats, helping Republicans. When, when a, a Category 5 storm comes, it doesn't hit Democratic blocks or Republican blocks. It but hits But you still everybody. have to work with everyone. Of course you have to work with everyone, but in an emergency, we still kind of pulled together. Look what happened in Surfside, right? In Surfside, I mean, that may be the only picture where Joe Biden and Ron DeSantis are staying, sitting next to each other. Uh, but in emergencies, we still have to try to come together as a country and, and put, you know, obviously our partisan differences on, aside. You mentioned Parkland. Uh, Congressman Deutsch uh, had an integral role when that happened. How would you say your style is different or similar to Congressman Deutsch? Yeah, I think Ted and I are, will have a very similar uh, a similar approach to Congress. I think he's been a fantastic congressman, a model congressman. When you think about what a congressman or congresswoman should be, I think Ted Deutsch really embodies uh, service. It's public service. Uh, I mean, listen, after Parkland, I mean, I went up to Tallahassee and I passed what became the Marjorie Stillman Douglas School Safety Act. I, I, my bill helped raise the age to 21 to buy any gun here in the state. Mandatory three-day waiting periods. We banned bump stocks. We instituted red flag laws, which have been used over 8,000 times now in the state of Florida. We raised the age to 21 four years before New York uh, and Rhode Island, who just did it in, in response to the Texas shooting. So while we didn't ban assault weapons, which I want to do, we made a tremendous amount of progress. That law would have prevented what happened at my high school. You say you want to ban assault weapons, and you, were, you played an important role after Parkland, as you mentioned as well. And now there was a bipartisan bill that the president signed. We just had another mass shooting this past weekend. How would you go about doing what you want to do and the steps that need to be taken. Yeah, that was a good bill that they passed, necessary but not sufficient, right? So sometimes we, we, when we're making progress, we want to throw the Hail Mary. We want to get it all done at once. And that's just not how Washington's working right now. So you move the ball five yards, you move the ball 15 yards. That was a moving the ball 10 yard sort of play. Now we come back obviously, and we try to do more. And we're going to continue to have more and more of these mass shootings until, as a country, we restrict weapons from the people who should not have 
have them. I mean, red flag laws is something that's being used by Republican sheriffs all across the state of Florida. Republicans voted for the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas bill. A Republican governor signed it. He's now a U.S. senator. Not one Republican lost their reelection. And so I think what people in Washington need to see is that you can do common sense reform. We're not, this is not about restricting constitutional rights, but it is about living up to an obligation to parents that when you drop your kid off at school, you're going to be able to pick them up at the end of the day and not have to worry about the things that parents have to worry about now in America. Common sense reform, like what? Well, I think we should raise the age of 21. I mean, federally, I think that is a good compromise if we can't ban assault weapons. First of all, these are weapons of war. They don't belong on the streets. It's why people in military service oftentimes come out and say we shouldn't be able to buy assault weapons just at the regular store. But raising the age to 21 would make a tremendous amount of mitigating a lot of these mass shootings. The overwhelming majority of these mass shootings are kids under the age of 21. So that's a simple, common sense reform. It doesn't prohibit the parent taking a kid hunting. It doesn't prohibit the parent buying uh, their kid under 21 a gun, but it does prohibit a kid on his own going into a store, walking out with two assault weapons, 300 rounds of ammunition, body armor, armed for war. That same kid can't go into a Hertz or an Enterprise and rent a car until they're 25 because car insurance companies have decided a 24-year-old is too much of a liability, but an 18-year-old can buy an assault weapon. It makes no logical sense, and that's why it's common sense. Would you be satisfied with that, or would you take it a step further? Well, listen, I think you get that in place, and we can see what the evidence is. I mean, here in Florida, we believe it's made a significant difference between the red flag laws and raising the age of 21. And that's why the red flag laws have been used 8,000 times. Think about it, 8,000. If we've been right in one half of 1% of those cases, you're talking about 45 major events have been prevented by having red flag laws. Let's move to abortion. The Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. Yeah, we disaster. know that. We saw protests around the country, and the state of Florida also has its abortion law in place. How would you proceed with that if you were a member of Congress? Sure. I think we need to immediately call for a vote uh, on the on the U.S. Senate floor, uh, bypassing the filibuster and trying to codify Roe v. Wade. I came out with that position uh, months ago. When so you would bypass the filibuster? I would bypass the filibuster. The President of the United States just came out in favor of that a couple of days ago. He uh, said he would be in favor of that's that. That's right. Uh, that was my position a couple of months ago. And the reason it was my position, quite frankly, is what has just happened is the Republicans have, have used the nuclear option, right? They stole two Supreme, Court, two Supreme Court justices. I say two because they came up with a rule that allowed them to steal Merrick Garland's seat that, oh, we don't appoint in the last year of a president. Okay, new rule. We lost the Merrick Garland seat. But then in the last year of the Trump administration, they, that rule they created went away, and they got to appoint Amy Coney Barrett. So they, told, they stole two seats with this creating a rule and then dropping a rule. They had Supreme Court justices come under oath in their confirmation hearings and lie to the U.S. Senate saying this was precedent. It's precedent on top of precedent, right? We're not going to touch it. So this was a strategy that they've had. It's been four decades in the making to undo this. So that's why I do believe that we have to bypass Roe v. bypass the filibuster and codify Roe v. Wade. I also believe... Does that set a dangerous precedent, though? They're going to do it anyway. Jackie, I believe that if they get power in the House and in the Senate and eventually the presidency, I believe after half the states will have abortion, right? There's no way they're going to just let that go. And they're not going to let Chuck Schumer, if he's the minority leader, stop it. They will do it if we don't. Are you saying that perhaps the Republicans will take the House and Senate in the next election? Well, I mean, listen, I'm just saying at some point they will, right? Like if history shows us anything, right? It goes back and forth. But whenever they get power, Two, four, six, eight. Whenever they get power, they will do this. If you were to win this seat, would you be able to put all of this aside and be able to work in a bipartisan way with the Republicans? Well, I, listen, I've done that. I mean, I've shown I can do that, right? When it's for the benefit of the state of Florida, I did that when I became the emergency management director in an administration of a guy I didn't vote for and I didn't support. So I have a history of doing what I think is right for my constituents uh, and not necessarily what is politically expedient. You received an important endorsement from Hillary Clinton. What does that mean for you and your campaign? Well, I mean, listen, if Hillary had become president, you know, we wouldn't be, we wouldn't be in this mess, quite frankly, uh, of, of what's going on politically, of how divided we are. Uh, and so I, I think, you know, an endorsement from Secretary Clinton to have her faith uh, and her uh, 
never endorsement. I mean, to, to show that in this campaign, I think is just tremendous. I mean, what what a legacy she has left, uh, almost becoming president, first woman uh, almost to ever become president, secretary of state, a first lady, a U.S. senator. Uh, she has fought Trump. She's been in the trenches. She knows that I'm the Democrat to win this seat. She knows I have the best Democratic values. Uh, and so, you know, I think people of this district, uh, when they see Secretary Clinton weighing in, and by the way, she doesn't do that that often. She hasn't done that in many open seats. I think people should take from that is that they know that I'm the guy who's ready to go and fight the Republicans in Washington. I have to ask you one final question because Americans are having a hard time right now going to the gas station, yeah. going to the supermarket. Inflation is at an all-time high. Historic numbers all across the board. Who do you blame for that? Well, listen, it's easy in politics, right, and sometimes in life. We, we want a boogeyman. Right, we want to blame someone. We want to point a finger. Right? What's going on now with gas prices and inflation and supply chain and commodities, there's not one thing that went wrong. There's not one person okay, that did that. And Americans are smart. They know that. Right? People who want to politicize that will, will try to point a finger. Listen, we had a pandemic. We turned the world off. And then we try to turn it back on. Try not driving your car for two years and then try to start it you know, after that. There's, there's problems. right? So there's a global economy. That's number one. Number two is China's shutting down, turning on, shutting down. You got a war in Ukraine, right, that's affecting both supply chain and gas prices because we had no choice but to put sanctions on Russia, which affected gas prices. So that's a big factor. And then listen, between the last year of the Trump administration and the first year of the Biden administration, they pumped a lot of money in the economy to try to make sure we didn't go into a depression uh, after COVID. So you put $6 trillion into the economy. All of these things happening at once uh, are, are kind of why we're, we're in this mess. And there's not one person or one party. Now, I think that Democrats are in power, and as a result, we have an ability, we have a responsibility, quite frankly, to try to fix it, right? To make sure people understand. We know that gas right now is, you know, 460, 470 for regular, uh, and that we're doing everything we can to try to get gas prices down, whether that's doing things here domestically, doing things internationally, fixing the supply chain issue. You know, baby formula thing was a huge deal. I mean, that's things that we could be doing on the front end using the Production Act, which the president did, which I thought was very smart and a good move, which is why some of, the, some of that has subsided. Uh, but this is about fixing problems. Sometimes things happen and there's not one thing that did it, why, one thing that caused it or one person to blame. But it's about how you're going to fix that problem. And that's why, look, in disaster management, problems happen all the time. It's about addressing them and fixing them quickly. We're going to have to leave it there. Commissioner, thank you so much. As thank always, you so and good much. luck to you. Thank you.